It's a little bit awkward. Okay, I'll just hold it like this. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> So I'm going to talk today focusing on the emergence of the Wages for Housework Committee in Canada. Yeah, I think that's good. And focusing specifically on the activities of the group in Toronto. Um, so I'll begin by examining some of the key elements of the Wages for, for Housework perspective before looking at the growth of the movement in Canada um, and focusing on struggles related to social wages, welfare, uh, and lesbian struggles for child custody in order to illustrate some of the broader objectives of the group within the Canadian and international contexts. So the Wages for Housework perspective uh, from a more broadly speaking, so future Wages for Housework feminists, both in Canada um, and within the network more broadly, were involved in pre-existing student, feminist, worker, and leftist groups in the late 1960s and early 1970s. So feeling limitations in terms of capacity for struggle within some of these groups, Wages for Housework feminists uh, emerged with a theoretical perspective and plan for political action that was aimed at fighting um, against oppression rooted in patriarchy and capitalism, and also looking at the way labor is divided on a, a global scale. So the founding meeting for the future Wages for Housework group um, was a meeting of the International Feminist Collective in Padua in early the early 1970s. Um, and so here the core perspective of the group developed and focused on a belief that addressing capitalism and patriarchy was paramount in changing social relations rather than seeking um, so-called emancipation through work outside the home for women, um, which as we see increasingly today often happens at the expense of someone in a more marginalized position. So in recognizing the place of marginalized women in a hierarchical social uh, relationship, the Wages for Housework perspective effectively connected the, de the devaluation of housework inside the home to the subsequent devaluation of similar kinds of work performed outside of the home for wages. So in the book, The Power of Women and the Subversion of the Community, Maria, Zero Maria Rosa Della Costa and Salma James called for a wide widened conception of um, the working class to include unwaged workers, specifically housewives working without a wage in the home. So this, uh, the power of women and subversion of the community is the kind of foundational text for the Wages for Housework movement. Um, and so this expansive view of the working class is connected to autonomous Marxism and the tradition of Italian operaismo or workerism as it translates into English. So as the terrain for struggle expanded beyond the factory, um, mobilizations of left feminists centered on broader issues, including education, uh, daycare, healthcare, housing, and a general lack of social services. So trying to look at the way uh, a lot of work gets unloaded onto personal private family relations and particularly the work of women in the home. So an expanded view of the working class also meant recognizing the way the working class is divided according to who is paid a wage and who is not. So for wages for housework feminists, it was important to emphasize the fact that while some people do not receive a wage like housewives or students, they are still embedded in capitalist social relations. So a rereading of Marx and Engels by Wages for Housework Feminists conceived of the home as the base for the social, for the factory system, sorry, rather than positioning the home outside of relations of production. So the notion of the social factory came out of autonomous Marxism, recognizing the overwhelming dominance of capitalism uh, and how this overwhelming dominance makes it increasingly difficult to draw distinctions between what is social life and what is work. So based on this analysis, Wages for Housework viewed housework as a number of different forms of labor, including both physical and emotional forms of labor. So as an expanded view of work and a focus on the social factory uh, meant that housework and social relationships in the home must be acknowledged as part of the factory system and as work rather than as something that exists outside of work or outside of so-called relations of production. So that's the, the broad kind of overall perspective of wages for housework. So I'm going to focus on looking at some of the activities within Canada and what the group uh, in Toronto was doing. So by the time wages for housework officially emerged in Canada in the fall of 1974, there was a solid group of women who came from different segments of the new left um, women's movements in Toronto, the lesbian movement, anti-war movements, and student movements. 
So the group grew as the movement developed and expanded, leading to increased involvement of women in groups like Wages Do Lesbians and the Lesbian Mothers Defense Fund, as well as groups uh, who were focused on uh, working with immigrant women uh, and domestic workers. So I would love to talk about all the different work that they're involved in. I'm gonna focus specifically on struggles focused on social wages, welfare, and the issue of lesbianism and child custody, and how those all relate to this kind of widened view of both wages and work. <coughs> so Wages for Housework feminists viewed the demand for the wage uh, as both a literal demand and a symbolic demand. So the symbolic element of the demand was used to highlight the issue, the issue of wagelessness. So the multiple view of the wage allowed for the group to connect demands um, for a, what's called social wages, so access to social services like healthcare, welfare, daycare, etc. Feminists involved with uh, Wages for Housework in Toronto connected with existing groups like the Committee to Advance the Status of Housework, which was a grassroots nonprofit education group for women that was founded in 1975. And similarly, Wages for Housework became involved with the Mother-Led Union, which was a group uh, that was associated with welfare struggles originally developed in the United States in the 1960s. So this group, um, the Mother-Led Union, demanded uh, a guaranteed annual income for everyone, regardless of work or marital status, and demanded that mothers on social assistance be granted the same amount of money as those who were uh, doing foster care. So the Mother-Led Union in Canada is an example of a push towards autonomous struggles for welfare, particularly against single mothers, or amongst, sorry, amongst single mothers. Wages for Housework joined easily with the mother-led union because the message was the same. Women, whatever their specific situation, needed more money and to work less. So the position of welfare mothers amplified and clarified the position um, of all housewives and of all women. And as Sylvia Federici argued in Wages Against Housework, in 1975, quote, welfare mothers have challenged the role women must perform in capitalist society because in refusing their motherhood as a natural given to be paid for with their lives, they have refused the alternatives capital forces upon women, i.e. marriage or the factory, unpaid work or extra work, end quote. So the Wages for Housework Committee in Toronto uh, fought with women to keep welfare benefits and to keep uh, sorry, and to increase and facilitate access to these benefits. And they also worked to educate women about their rights to specific social assistance programs through different pamphlets and publications. Um, so welfare was presented as a wage that in some ways valued housework, though certainly not at a rate um, that was adequate or enough to uh, provide any real alternatives. So another example of Wages for Housework's linking to the issue of social wages is evident when we look at the early work of Wages for Housework in Canada, which was connected to family allowance. So family allowance, or more popularly known as the baby bonus, was a program that started in Canada in 1945 as an incentive for women to have more children in the post-war period. So it was universal, meaning that it went to all families, regardless of income, as long as they had children. So the most important aspect of family allowance is that it came as a monthly check paid to the mother in the home directly, except in the case of Quebec where it, it went to the, the father in the home. So this was often one of the only forms of money that women received in their own name if they were not employed outside the home. So because it was paid to women, it again valued housework, at least on a symbolic level. And so as the Trudeau government proposed cuts to family allowance programs in the late 1970s, Wages for Housework Feminists organized a hands-off the family allowance campaign, going door to door to schools, community groups, et cetera, getting people to sign a petition demanding that the Trudeau government uh, not claw back these programs as part of larger cutbacks to social services, um, although they were ultimately not uh, entirely successful with, their, with, that, with that plan. So I'm going to shift a bit now to talk about the issue of lesbianism and uh, child custody and thinking about struggles for autonomy in that context. So Wages Do Lesbians grew out of the Toronto Wages for Housework Committee, examining forms of gender and class-based oppressions outside of the context of heterosexual relationships. The main focus of the group in Toronto would be custody rights for lesbian mothers, resulting in the development of the Lesbian Mothers Defense Fund, 
And actually, the Lesbian Mothers Defense Fund ended up lasting well beyond the activities of Wages for Housework and Wages to Lesbians uh, itself. So prior to the 1970s, many lesbian mothers did not fight for custody of their children um, be through the homophobic court system for fear of being outed, shamed, or viewed as delinquent because of their homosexuality. So even in the wake of the decriminalization of homosexuality in 1969, many lesbians who had previously conceived and raised their children in heterosexual relationships feared being viewed as deviant because of, of persisting regulation of homosexuality. So this meant that many of them would choose to remain in the closet for fear of being denied custody or access to their children. As Canada's family law system began to change, the courts looked back to the same-sex couple, which reminds us that queer individuals are accepted according to their ability to adhere to heteronormative criteria of citizenship, um, or what has come to be termed uh, homonationalism or homonormativity. So assumptions connected to homonationalism are rooted in notions of class respectability and white privilege. So wages due lesbians resisted these restrictions, um, arguing that forcing lesbian mothers to either live alone and support themselves or return to their heterosexual relationships was not a real option when we consider the kinds of jobs available to women in the 1970s. So low-waged, precarious, and feminized job ghettos. Lesbian mothers struggled with choosing between raising children alone um, on a low income or remaining in an undesirable marriage until the children were older. So when lesbian mothers attempted to fight for custody in the court system, they would often lose, even though uh, legislation was changing, there was still uh, a lot of difficulty. So these choices were constrained. The struggle for wages appealed to lesbians who joined Wages Do Lesbians because they were able to see how free labor in the home, so performed by straight women and lesbian women alike, undermined their work outside the home in terms of both wages and job security. So the choices seem to be amazing, seem to be remaining closeted and relying on a man's wage, or remaining closeted and taking your chances in a job market that discriminated against women generally and lesbians particularly. So being a lesbian, sorry, because a lesbian mother was often forced to be a sole support parent, her financial options were incredibly limited. A focus on lesbianism in relation to the Wages for Housework perspective meant fighting for choices around sexuality for both gay and straight women. Lesbianism was viewed as a terrain of struggle under capitalism. So heterosexuality is structured and determined by capitalism, uh, they argued, and affects the way men and women are able to relate to each other. So within both Wages for Housework and Wages Do Lesbians, there was a recognition that relationships between men and women would not disappear if a woman were not involved in a romantic partnership with a man, um, because both straight and lesbian women continue to be oppressed by the combined, combined forces of patriarchy and capitalism. And further, capitalism imposes heteronormativity as it ensures that the needs of the workers, of the workforce, will be met within the confines of the family, so that capital can absolve itself of any obligation to ensure um, that these needs are met elsewhere. The perspective they advocated, therefore, was to say if women had access to money, they would have more options to make choices and to create alternative lifestyles for themselves. So the analyses of both work and wages developed by Wages for Housework allows us to see the connections between the unwaged work of women in the home and the devaluation of the same work in the labor market. So when wages are absent, then work is rendered invisible. A narrow view of the productive quality of work also masks emotional or immater immaterial forms of labor. So when we're able to uncover or highlight uh, these invisible or immaterial forms of labor, then we see a group of workers whose labor is very clearly being exploited. So students are one element of an, inv of a, an invisible workforce, um, some, many of whom don't even see themselves as workers. Um, and more than being unwaged, students are actually paying for the privilege um, to be workers because of tuition fees. So while many see education, um, particularly post-secondary education, as a necessary stepping stone in, uh, to stability in terms of long-term employment um, and you know, stable wages, we're currently faced with the reality uh, of a job market that's increasingly pre precarious. Um, and as I'm sure you all know uh, this, so I don't need to, to highlight that for you. 
So when we consider the issue of the rise of, the precarious, uh, of precarious work more broadly, it becomes increasingly difficult to ignore the impacts of globalization and neoliberalism, particularly when we consider who is most impacted by austerity measures, the rise of the informal workforce, and the normalization of a precarious labor market. So as unemployment, rate, unemployment rates rise, the growing informal economy is made up of invisible forms of labor. So women, particularly those in the global south, make up a huge portion of the infor informal workforce, which is largely invisible and subject to precarious work situations, exploitative conditions, and low wages. The global north's growing need for cheap reproductive labor, for example, is met by the work of women from the global south who have been forced into this work by their economic circumstances. Living caregiver programs are used to capitalize on economic inequalities of globalization while continuing to marginalize migrant workers um, or others with precarious status, particularly women of color, reinforcing the systematic marginalization of all women through the continued devaluation of housework. And so as long as housework is seen as non-productive and as work that is unskilled, then women who work in this area, uh, and we think about this area in a, in a very broad way, um, then women who work in this area will continue to be economically and socially disadvantaged. Um, so I'll end here and hope that there'll be some good discussions after. And if anyone wants any, anything clarified um, in terms of terminology, just let me know. <laughs>